for more on the reasons behind New Zealand's success. We're joined now by Dr. Rishi Desai. He's the Chief Medical Officer for the health education website osmosis.org. Uh, Rishi, thanks so much for joining us. New Zealand, as we heard, acted firmly and decisively. Uh, who else did, who didn't, and what were the sort of consequences that we've seen as a result? Yeah, we've had a, a number of countries we can look at now. So New Zealand's a shining example of the right way to do this. Uh, other examples of ways to do this correctly, or at least have strong elements of the right way to do it, would be Germany, South Korea, Singapore. These are all examples that the world should follow in terms of how we, we should have uh, played this out. Strong isolation early on, strong leadership with uh, you know empathy and and setting a good example herself. You just uh, played a little clip. I think these are all things that we look to in terms of what our leaders ought to do in terms of guiding us. Uh, where it wasn't done that way is my home country of the U.S. We we didn't follow that playbook. Instead, it's been very scattershot, state to state. Some states have done uh, the best they could given the circumstances. But again, it hasn't been nearly as effective as New Zealand. I mean, a country of 5 million people with only 12 deaths, that's remarkable. I mean, it's shockingly good. And so we could have all had that similar outcome if we had isolated early and had more testing. And so that's what I want to talk to you about, tests. This has been a bit of a tug of war. We're still hearing from governors that they don't have enough kits. Why are people who want to get tested for whatever reason being denied? Why not test everyone? Yeah, you know, it's a supply-demand issue right now. So a lot of hospitals don't have the supplies they need. And it comes down to a number of things. I'll try to, to, to lay it out quickly. In the, in the month of February, there are only two uh, emergency use authorizations that were granted by the, C, by the FDA. One was to the CDC, and that test ended up being a pretty faulty test. So a lot of public health labs didn't have a good test back in February. In, in March is when we saw many more emergency use authorizations go through, and in April, so now two months into this, uh, we see about a million tests per week. Now, mind you, that number hasn't risen. It's been about a million per week pretty steadily in April. And so we hope that that goes up. One of the reasons that hasn't gone up even further is that there are uh, problems where, you know, let's say there's an academic uh, hospital and they're trying to do testing for a clinical hospital. The clinical hospital says, well, we don't have a vendor relationship with that place. We can't accept them. Or, or our uh, patient data can't transfer back and forth, so we can't accept it. We have in the U.S. a very fragmented healthcare system. So when people want to work together, even if they want to work together, they can't because there are no legal kind of uh, contracts drawn up. There's no easy way to transfer data. All these things are stymieing us right now to get this coordinated response. And don't even get me started on serology. Right now, when we talk about serology, there's only four emergency use authorizations for serologic testing. There are many, many, many backlogged ones. So the FDA hasn't passed on a lot of the EUAs that they need to for serologic testing, yet we're already talking about de-isolation. So it seems really odd to me that we're asking for more testing, and yet the federal government, the FDA specifically, hasn't gotten more EUAs out. We don't have any kind of national guidance around how to do more testing on the serologic side or even like what normal levels should be this would, because we haven't done enough testing. This would be the antibody testing that they're talking about would exist for that. What would be the benefits of that? Yeah, great question. So antibody testing tells you the answer to the following question. Did I have COVID-19? Now, when we not not do I have, but did I at some point in the past, did I have it? If I did have it, I'm immune. I'm, I'm now able to kind of reenter society. Sounds like an awesome test, right? But the problem with that test is we don't know what normal levels should be. How do we know that? More testing. Once we get more data, we'll have the answer to that. You know, this is a problem that comes up with every test, every test you've ever had yourself. When you go to the doctor's office, we have to establish what the normal limit should be. And so this is not a new problem, but this is a problem you solve with getting more testing done so we have more data to work with so we can smartly or scientifically say, oh, this is the level for an immune person. This is the level for a non-immune person. If you don't do testing, you'll never figure that out. Rishi, I have to ask you as a medical professional, last week Donald Trump announced he'd be pausing U.S. contributions to the World Health Organization. I looked up WHO figures at the end of January of this year, meaning before this pandemic, the U.S. still owed WHO some 200 in membership fees in arrears acquired during the Trump administration. What do, you, what do you make of that? How can you expect the WHO to do its job if its members aren't paying its fees? 
Yeah, I mean, the WHO is really, in many ways, the only thing standing between a very poor country and this pandemic getting much worse, right? Like, th that funding is critical. And we need every country around the world to be safe from COVID-19 if we here in the U.S. want to be safe from COVID-19 because all those folks, they travel. And so if you have folks in other countries that can't get, you know, treated or, you know, a vaccine down the road, it's not going to be safe for us here. The WHO funding is critical, right? So every member country that's part of that has to recognize that we're all in this together and we can't defund it, not at this critical juncture. This would be the worst time to take away, you know, WHO funding because that puts us all at risk. All right, Dr. Rishi Desai from osmosis.org, thank you very much. Thank you.